All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here. I'm going to wait till we have a few viewers before I apologize for starting late. All right, let's log ourselves in. Discovery tour. Today we are going to head out of... Um, we're going to head out of the Peloponnesian Peninsula. We're going to stop by uh, Argos, the ancient enemy of Sparta. We're going to check out a few things there. Um, and then we'll hopefully get to Athens. Uh, for those people who just tuned in, I do apologize. I was having some fritzy internet issues. I was really trying to make sure that we had a uh, video for this one. So um, what we're going to do, I'm hoping to get out of uh, Sparta and Laconia, and we're gonna head up, let's see, we're gonna head up through Arcadia, through Argolis, and you know what? Honestly, let's uh, let's skip this whole wasteland. It's not a wasteland, that's mean. Shouldn't say things like that, prerogative. Um, and instead, we're just gonna fast travel. What we'll do is we'll go from Argos, uh, the ancient, enemy of Sparta, as I mentioned. I know, I am tardy. It's bad. Um, and then we're going to head to Athens. So, let's check out where the heck are we? Oh, beautiful. Look, we, we, live in a, we, we live in a wonderful area here in uh, California, but this is really quite something. I wish I lived on the, on the ocean like this. I grew up in, god, the very far from the ocean. So here we are in Nafia Harbor. Look at these fish. So something I found out is that a big source of protein in the ancient world and in the Mediterranean in general was tuna. Uh, I always thought of tuna as the Pacific Ocean or at least deep sea ocean fish. They're huge, right? They're like 800 pounds. Um, and it, I found out that no, that they can be found right off the coast of Greece. So, the Greeks were getting a lot of their protein there, also from sheeps, sheeps, I believe it's just sheep, goats. And here we have this. So, uh, what can you tell me about this chat? Uh, we've got the Owl of Athena, but we're not even close to Athens, so what's going on? What's going on is that this Noplia area is, in fact, uh, part of the Delian League, which we will learn about in class later on. But the Delian League is the alliance slash empire. Uh, it begins as a voluntary for, uh, system of, hey, let's defend ourselves from the Persians. And it becomes Athens saying, give us money or we're going to burn down your city, as all good empires end up being. Let's check this out. So one of my favorite pieces of architecture is this form of a house where in the middle, you have a courtyard, a little um, atrium kind of thing. I don't know what it's called in, in Greece, in Greek, but atrium is how you say it in, uh, in Latin. And here, the rain is just going to come, come in here, fill up, you can wash your feet, scrub them down a little bit. It's delightful. Hello, sir. So they just move about. Don't mind me raiding your house. And while we have the harbor here, let's grab this point of interest. And then we can check out the, the beachfront while we then start moving northeast uh, and then into Argos itself. Okay. Where are we headed? How cool is this guy? Man, I wish that the Greeks actually looked like this. Uh, that looks very cool. If that is in fact historical, the guy's probably insanely wealthy. Uh, you know, a typical hoplite is going to be part of the middle class. You have to be if you're going to afford to coat yourself in bronze. Even today, that's going to be a really expensive uh, outfit to buy. You know, like I, if my stream ever makes money, the first place I'm going to invest in is a better camera. The second thing is a full hoplite panoply, so I look dope. Uh, but that's probably going to set me back like 1200 bucks. That's, that's not cheap. And back in the day when everyone's going to make it by hand, will pull the bronze out of the out of the earth it's themselves, it's gonna cost you quite a bit. So that guy we just saw, very wealthy. Ooh, okay. Uh, 
Okay, so here's a little mythological area. Uh, Heracles fighting the Lernaean Hydra with the help of his nephew Iole Ioleus, seen from Black Figure Amphora. Let's check this out. So here we got Heracles. How can we tell? He's wearing the skin of the Nemean lion. Um, the other thing that you can tell, the, uh, the other way to, to distinguish Hercules is, of course, broad shouldered, uh, very muscular, typically has a club, um, and then it looks like this is his cousin Aeolus. Heracles' second labor was to kill the Lernaean Hydra, a water monster with numerous poison heads that lived in Lake Lerna of Argolis. So Heracles is the Greek version, Hercules is the Roman version slash Disney version that we all know and love. One of the heads was immortal, and for each head that was chopped off, two more would generate in its place. The number of the heads was reportedly between 6 and 50. So one thing I really like about reading mythology is, okay, the Hydra is one thing, and it's cool to think about some scaly-headed creature uh, that lives in the swamp and eats people. Um, but if you think about what could a Hydra represent in real life, you know, how often do you encounter a problem that you think you solve it, or at least you, you solve it the quickest way you can, and then solving it the fast way, cutting corners, right, or cutting heads off, uh, if you will, sprouts multiple more heads. So when you approach a problem, stab it in the heart rather than cut off the, you know, these are spindly little heads. That's the easy way out. Uh, so stab it in the heart first. Don't, don't chop the heads off. In order to kill the Hydra, Heracles needed the help of his nephew Iolaus. As Heracles cut off its head, Iolaus cauterized the wounds to prevent them from growing again. Okay, so don't stab it in the heart, but think smarter, not harder, right? Um, to cut off the immortal head, Heracles used a golden sword given to him by Athena. Oh, gotta love that deus ex machina. Athena comes in, gives a gift, and it's all good. After his victory, he dipped his arrows in the Hydra's poisonous blood, having the instinct that they would come in handy for his upcoming labors, labors. and yes, in fact, they did. Uh, I, as you probably know, am not very good at the myth mythology, um, but I, I definitely know that having poisonous arrows is going to come in handy. Alright, so we got some cool birds. No Hydra anywhere. That probably has to save for... Uh, that's probably save for... Uh, the actual full game and not the educational version. Though it would be really cool to get some more monsters in this. I would love that. Uh, but I'm not complaining because this is quite a good historical reenactment. So here we go. This is Argos. I'm gonna dismount so I'm not, I don't uh, trample anyone. As you know, I'm a big fan of human-centered infrastructure. I'm really not trying to ride a horse in this, uh, in this town. It's quite rude. It's like driving the SUV through a dog park. So here we have what looks like pitch, I imagine. So some industrial process. Hopefully we will get an idea of what's going on. Uh, is there a point of interest anywhere? So if it doesn't look like it, but in the chat, uh, let me know if you have any ideas about what could be going on here. We have this crane, this mill, um, and then we have you know these steaming vats of something disgusting looking. I don't want to fall in here. And out at the bottom, you know, there it's... Uh, oh, and they've got rope. So I actually, I'm going to stand by the pitch, right? So tar. Uh, you've got the cables of rope here, and they would cover the, the rope in tar to help prevent it from from breaking down at sea, from the brine, from the all the uh, elements that you're going to encounter in the ocean. Uh, same thing with the bottoms of boats. They're going to caulk the bottoms with ah. tar. Excuse me, lady. Um, and otherwise, try to protect the ships. So here we go. God, I haven't been to Argos yet uh, in this version or the previous one, I said. And this is really it's quite beautiful. I love the, the blue and gold color scheme. The walls are great. Why do they need walls? Because they border Sparta. And unlike Sparta, their men are not their walls, they actually have legit walls. Frescoes. Okay, so frescoes are an art type. We're going to take a look at this. Uh, inspired by the art of Assassin's Creed by Kate Lewis, with courtesy from Titan Books. Titan Books, what a fitting uh, publisher of this. These detailed frescoes adorn the walls of residential houses, villas, gymnasia, bathhouses, boats, temples, and 
pretty much any other surface in the game. These sketches by Ubisoft artists show a tiny selection of the frescoes found in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So frescoes are a type, a special type of um, painting where it's it's wet on wet. So this is what Bob Ross does. No, okay, hold up. Bob Ross does wet on wet, but this is also wet on wet, just different. So you cover the um, wall in plaster, or at least you cover whatever part you're working on, you cover it in plaster, and while the plaster is setting, while it continues to be wet, you paint over it, and the, there's a chemical reaction between... I did not prepare this, I'm sorry. Uh, I believe it's the lime in the plaster and the paints, and so it actually makes the paints uh, more vivid uh, and more beautiful, and this is actually how Michelangelo got his start, is he was working in some in other artist's studio, he was a child, and was a fresco painter. So. Uh, look at this. We've got some. Uh, this is uh, olive. These are. This is olive harvesting. Um, I know because I did some of it this past summer. It was really hard work. You're shaking. You should look up online. Um, you should look up uh, the the machines that now harvest olives. It's pretty dope. It's a giant. It's a truck that has like this big pincer in the front, and it grabs it, and then it has like an upside down umbrella that swings out and it shakes viciously, and all the olives come out, which is great because. As I know from experience, getting on a 20-foot ladder and like physically shaking it, really hard work. Uh, we got a goose eating some stuff. We got a naked dude with wings. Love all of this. And then we have the frescoes. So we will see frescoes throughout this game. Um, and here we go. Look, this is the, those olives that we saw earlier. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the frescoes are repeated throughout the game. Uh, but that makes sense, right? They are making a combat game and not expecting a dwarf like me to be hanging out looking at all the art. Okay, let's go through Argos. This looks like a pretty well-developed town. Uh, we've got their Acropolis up here, right in the crook of the mountain, so that's going to be both where their shrine, main shrine is, but also when the Spartans show up. Uh, should the Spartans break through their walls, which I don't think they do historically. Uh, then that is going to be where they flew to. So we've got a nice philosopher. I don't know any famous people from Argos. They were, they were not a center of wisdom. They were a center of anti-Spartan hatred. And that's unfortunately a thing you're going to hear me say in Argos a lot about how much they hated the Spartans. Uh, because most of the history that comes down to us, the written history at least, is all about great power conflicts and geopolitical struggles. And so we hear about the smaller cities, the smaller place, Argos, Corinth, uh, which are not even that small, they're quite major, but Elis, Olympia, etc. Most of these, we hear about them only in relation to the larger struggles of, say, Athens. Or All right, Hephaestus. So this guy is not Hephaestus, though he's channeling the spirit of Hephaestus. Um, here we have a uh, crater, I believe. Um, is a red, red figure cup, and Hephaestus is giving Thetis the arms of Achilles. So Thetis is the mom of uh, Achilles, right? She's the one who, who dunks him in the in the in the river Styx, I think, um, and gra you know uh, protects him. But then Hephaestus, after in the Iliad, uh, Achilles goes berserk, at, um, or so. Okay, what happens is Achilles doesn't want to fight Patroclus. Uh, dons his armor, takes the field of battle, and is like, guess what, guys? Achilles is here. Runs train on a bunch of people, and then him, he himself is killed by Hector, and then Hector takes all of Achilles' armor. And so Achilles is both out of his boyfriend and uh, all his arms and armor, so his mom goes to Hephaestus and says, hey, can you please make my son a whole new panoply? And he does. And there's a whole long scene in the Iliad describing the shield of Achilles. And the shield of Achilles has scenes from all all different aspects of ancient life. And it's one of the most famous scenes in the Iliad. So it's a beautiful description of, uh, of this ornamental shield. So Hephaestus was the god of metalworking and the patron god of blacksmiths, goldsmiths, carpenters, craftsmen, artisans, sculptors, and architects. His workshop was believed to be situated either on Mount Olympus or on the island of Lemnos. In the latter case, the volcano Moskilos of Lemnos was believed to spew fire from the god's subterranean workshop. I love it, right? How, before science, the natural world is seen through the lens of mythology. And so here we have Hephaestus working deep in the subterranean tunnels of this volcano, which is totally the dopest workshop you could 
you could imagine. Hephaestus' name was closely associated with fire. For example, during the Trojan War, when the river Scamandros tried to drown the great hero Achilles, Hephaestus burned the riverbanks and the entire nearby plain until the river boiled like a kettle. Uh, yeah, so as Achilles is going on his rampage and bloodlust and, and uh, totally uh, enraged and murdering everyone, he is going so hard that the river Scamander, which, uh, because it's ancient Greece, has its own divine uh, personification. The river Scamander is fighting Achilles and losing. And Achilles uh, has to be, like, pulled back lest he kill a god, because that is... Nay, 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 you can't do that, even if you are uh, as dope as Achilles. Because of his occupation as a copper, coppersmith, Hephaestus was usually depicted as having strong arms built for wielding hammers and tongs, but weak legs due to his constant standing in front of the anvil. However, other versions of Hephaestus' story state that he was born lame. So if anyone knows that story, uh, please put it in the chat. But yeah, he... Uh, I think it's because he was so ugly that Hera tossed him off Mount Olympus. He's like super, I don't know, not ADA compliant. But yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a sad thing that in the ancient world, not only Hephaestus, but any Spartan, uh, or vice versa, and not only any Sparta, Spartan who's born crippled, but a god even who is uh, born crippled was going to be cast off of a mountain and expected to die. Okay, so let's take a look at bronze in Argolis. I have no idea what this is going to contain, but I'm excited. Welcome to Argos, traveler. Who are you? Who is this person? My name is Herodotus, oh, and I am a traveler guy. from Harikarnassus. I retrace the cause of various events, such as Herodotus wars right and great I calamities. I but describe what I see and record what I am told, all with the aim of providing a better understanding of why these things occur. Look for me to introduce you to many sites. Cool. All right, let's begin this tour. This is Argos one of the oldest cities in Greece. The Argives were an ingenious people famous for innovations in areas like military tactics. However, what they were most renowned for was their metallurgic artistry, especially with bronze. I hope you enjoy yourself. Look for me at the end of your visit. Cool. Yeah, so Argos uh, definitely sent a large contingent to the, uh, to the Trojan War. They, ha they show up a lot in the ancient myths uh, and legends, and uh, you know, their history dates back thousands of years. The area that would become Argos was inhabited as early as the 3rd millennium BCE, but it was in the 7th century BCE that it officially became a city-state. One of Argos's major pillars was its metallurgical industry. As far back as the 8th century BCE, the city was famed for making products like long dress pins and tripod cauldrons, as well as impeccable body armor. In addition to their technical excellence, the Argives were also creative, as seen in their masterful bronze sculpting, which became prominent in the city during the 6th and 5th century BCE. Cool. Yeah, so we've seen a lot of these bronze statues everywhere. Um... And I, yeah, so they say that Argos didn't become a polis until the Caramba, 7th century BC. And that's typical for many of these city-states that we're going to see, is that it's after the Bronze Age collapse, it takes a few hundred years between, say, 1100 BC and around 800 BC that, uh, you know, the population has to recover from such a traumatic uh, decline for it to build up enough people and enough organization that it can become a... Uh, an organized, centralized city-state that we have here. Archaeologists have discovered a unique bronze set of armor consisting of a helmet and corslet in a warrior's tomb at Argos. The bell-shaped corslet is the earliest known piece of body armor from the Iron Age Greece. The corslet and the helmet display both the technical excellence and general sculpting skills Argos was known for. So here we have a bronze hyd hydria with inscription revealing that it's awarded as a prize at games for the goddess Hera. I didn't know Argos had games. 
Now, what I'd love, um, small critique, uh, but if they're gonna tell me all about this helmet and corslet, I'd love to see it instead of this, uh, you know, this, this cool pot. Uh, but not not what you tantalize me with about that that bronze corslet. Like, show show me that. So this might I'm assuming is gonna be part of the bronze making uh, process. Bronze is an alloy composed of 90% copper and 10% tin. Because of this, copper and tin needed to be smelted and combined to create the material needed for sculpting. After the bronze alloy was formed, it was melted in special furnaces. They required a tremendous amount of fuel and were usually supplied with charcoal made from specific types of wood. It's possible they were also coated with a protective lining of clay, which would have been sensible given the melting point of bronze is approximately 950 degrees Celsius. Once the bronze was melted and collected, the furnaces were dismantled and dumped. All right, so you know how I was saying that this is pitch at the beginning? I was wrong, my bad. Uh, but luckily, this keeps me humble. Um, yeah, so we got to talk about the Bronze Age, apparently, because we're here in Argos. Is we talked about in the very first uh, bit of class. Bronze is relatively easy to find. It's not easy. It's a precious metal, and it's rare. But it's relatively evenly s distributed through the Mediterranean and the Near Eastern world. Tin is not. Uh, if you've seen that amazing video, the History of the World, uh, where it's all sorts of crazy colors and hilarious um, messaging, one thing they say is, uh, you know, my dealer won't tell me where he gets his tin. That's because it comes either from Afghanistan or Wales, although it's unknown if they actually did have uh, contact with Wales. I think there's a tiny amount in... Um, in like Western Turkey, but not really. Uh, so it's very rare. And during the Bronze Age, that led to large states that are relatively cohesive and traded with one another because they had they had to maintain a stable supply of tin. Otherwise, the whole world would collapse. Right? It's basically why the U.S. stations an entire aircraft carrier fleet in the Strait of Hormuz, right off the coast of Saudi Arabia, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, because if oil stops flowing the world shuts down and it's mayhem. So the same thing 3,000 years ago uh, with tin. you got to make sure that you have a stable supply here. So here's a copper ingot. Obviously, it's uh, rusted and tarnished, turned to green. Black bronze is a modern term for ancient bronze artifacts with a fine black patina. Examples of black bronze include a special class of prestigious but non-functional Mycenaean bronze daggers that date back to the second century, second millennium BCE. The daggers were de decorated with black inlay and gold and silver foil using a technique called painting in metal. That sounds awesome. I, again, wish that we were looking at this instead of uh, a bronze ingot, but ancient bronze ingot, also kind of cool. Corinthian bronze, meanwhile, was the name given to copper alloys that were depletion gilded to acquire a golden surface you. Uh, anyone want to tell me for extra credit what depletion gilded means? Um, according to legend, Corinthian bronze was originally created by accident during the burning of Corinth in 146 BCE, which melted the city's immense quantities of gold, silver, and copper together. So, uh, 146 BCE is obviously way further than we're going to get in this class. It's about 300 years later than the classical era. And Greece at this point was resisting Roman occupation and conquest. And a, uh, I forget who it was, it was someone relatively famous, um, burned Corinth to the ground. is is pretty disastrous. Uh, it, you know, Corinth has a reputation for being a mercantile entrepot, beautiful, large, ornate. Uh, and we'll check it out at some point, probably closer to the Corinthian War in this class. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the Peloponnesian War in this class. Uh, but yeah, the whole city was burned, and like all the great burnings of beautiful places in history, like the Library of Alexandria, the, the Library in Baghdad, the House of Wisdom, it drives a stake through my heart. However, Pliny, a Roman historian, doubted the authenticity of this story because most of the artists who worked with Corinthian bronze lived long before the second century BC. Okay, so nice story, putting, putting it together with a... Uh, you know, some major geopolitical event, but it's not quite the case. Okay, let's continue on this tour. 
So these are the smelting pots. What's important to note, uh, and one of the reasons that pottery is so important, is that clay, once fired, has an incredibly high threshold temperature. And so uh, not only is it one of the first ways outside of baskets uh, that humans figure out how to store food, but it also is really important in, in, in industrial processes. You can cast metal in clay, and then uh, and it won't it won't break until it's finally cast. And then you shatter the clay on the outside, and it allows for the uh, cast bronze or metal op object inside to come free. In the eighth century BCE, most small-scale statues were molded using a complicated and lengthy method called solid lost wax casting. From the seventh century BCE onwards, metal workers adopted the more efficient hollow lost wax casting. At its core, this process involved using sculpting models from wax, making molds over these models, then filling the molds with bronze to produce the desired shapes. The process was advantageous because it saved on materials, produced lighter statues, and reduce the chance of possible defects. Okay, so, yeah, to cast something, like I was just saying, what you'd have is you'd make your statue out of wax, easy, you can carve at it, um, malleable, heat it up. If you need to redo something, just, you know, put some heat next to it and you can, you can erase it. Um, and then you cover it in clay, and then you fire it, the wax drains out, and then you fill it all with bronze. And there you go, you've got your bronze statue. So here we have a mold for a female head. Lost wax casting was one of the main techniques used in ancient jewelry making, along with hammering, filigree, and granulation. The technique was used to manufacture finger rings, earrings, bracelets, and dress pin pins. And then here we have a, uh, this is a, uh, a sculpture, though they don't say that that is one of the uses for lost wax casting. Let's climb up here. <coughs> Oops. Were you also trying to climb up this big wheel? Sorry. Put right. that away from you. Come on. So here we have a cool crane. Um, sorry, I just love exploiting the. Oh, don't spot that fire. And you know. Of course, you see that guy with Once the all swords, the pieces of the sculpture were molded, they were welded together and subjected to the cold working process. This process involved repairing the sculpture's flaws by filling any holes and cracks with specifically measured bronze patches. Afterwards, the sculpture was scraped, chiseled, and polished until it was deemed satisfactory. Decorative details like hair, eyebrows, and mustaches were added with the use of a sharp tool. Eyes, which could be inset with ivory, glass, or silver, were attached to their sockets using a resinous kind of glue. Teeth and fingernails were inlaid with silver, and lips and nipples with copper. These small touches added color and contributed to the sculpture's lifelike appearance. Yeah, you gotta have the, the copper lips and nipples. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting. I read a book on Michelangelo who does a lot of marble carving. And here you have abilities to patch, you can add things afterwards, you can, you have a, a bit of wiggle room, not a lot, uh, but you've got some. But with marble, you screw up. Like if he's carving David and he breaks the ankle, that's it. Like you have to start completely over. Uh, which is why it takes years to do a marble statue. Bronze is subject to corrosion from oxidation and weather. As a result, over time, the color of its surface turns green. However, once a copper op oxide layer is formed, the underlying metal is protected from further erosion or weathering. This superficial protective layer is called a patina which, and can develop naturally or artificially. So this is why the Statue of Liberty is green and is not further eroding. Otherwise, you know, at this point, it, like the, the face would look like a zombie. It'd like, be really sad if it were like, um, non-stainless steel or something. It, it looked pretty rough. The patina on most ancient Greek bronze statues is natural. Its color usually depends on the composition of the soil where the statues were found buried, or of the sea from which they were dis recovered. For example, the light green patina on a statuette of Zeus recovered from Denona is the result of the composition of local soil. So that's just one extra thing that you, that, uh, 
archaeologists can use to to determine where a statue is from or uh, you know any of the chemistry about uh, the provenance or where it comes from. I don't see a scene of cold working finished process from a red figure cup from Volki. This is so cool. So you really see every aspect of life on these vases. It's it's such a wide wide ranging artistic process that uh, these vases are going to show just regular industrial work, sculptors, sculptures and sculpture making uh, parties, um, really anything. Whereas I think oftentimes art is really only focused on the high or important events, whereas this is, it's really the everyday life with just random dudes making a statue. Bronze sculptures have a long and varied history in Greece. During the geometric period of 900 to 700 BCE, the sculptures mainly depicted idealized heroes, charioteers, and horses, and most of them were dedicated to sanctuaries. The orientalizing period followed in the 7th century BCE. During this time, Greeks began adopting sculpting techniques from the east, and the depicted statues expanded to include mythological creatures like griffins and sphinxes. The archaic period saw statues that reflected a better understanding of human anatomy, which eventually culminated in the realistic and powerful human sculptures of the Hellenistic period. So that actually gave a pretty good rundown of the different eras of Greek art, or at least pottery painting. It starts with geometric, where you have a lot of shapes and abstract figures, although you also have the, the mythological stories being represented, to the orientalizing period where you see, um, because of the development of trade networks once again, there's much more interaction between Greece and Europe and North Africa and the Near East, uh, the Levant, Egypt, and through this mixing, they become much more sophisticated artists, and it then goes on into the, um, into the uh, Hellenic era. And Orient, of course, is because they used to orient the map facing east, because the most important place to go is the east, that's where all this, the riches were. The Ryasi Riace bronzes are two life-size statues that were pulled out of the sea near Calabria, Italy in 1972. The statues date back to the 5th century BCE and display several of the hallmarks of classical Greek sculpture in terms of order, proportionality, harmony, and symmetry. The statues depict naked warriors of a mature age as indicated by their beards and faces. However, their bodies are robust, vigorous, and muscular. Based on their poses, at one point, each of them held a shield with their left hand and either a spear or sword in their right. While the statues were probably sculpted in the same workshop, inquiries into the identity of their sculptor remain inconclusive. Unsurprising. We're not likely going to find uh, biographical data of, of artists or any but the most important people from a few thousand years ago. And we are almost done. So I, uh, after this, I'm going to see if I can give uh, a little rundown of how Argos plays into the history of Greece. Because this has been awesome, um, but also something kind of besides uh, what our class focuses on. Argos was the home of Polykleitos, one of the most famous sculptors in ancient Greece. His works, like the Doriphorus and Diadomenos, as well as his treatise on sculpting called the Canon, had a massive impact on the art as a whole, particularly in regards to ideal body proportions. Sadly, the original versions of Polykleitos' sculptures have been lost, along with most bronze statues from antiquity. As time went on, many bronze statues were melted down to be recycled in things like weapons, ammunition, and even church bells. Because of this, marble copies from the Roman period are our best evidence of the masterpieces of Greek sculpture. Yeah, so many of the marble statues that we see today that are Greek in origin are actually made during the Roman era. Uh, and they're beautiful, they're truly amazing, and it's, I mean, honestly, if you're copying, if you're copying another statue in marble, you still have to be really freaking good at it. Uh, but a lot of these statues have not survived, as they mentioned. And I believe uh, 
A very famous one, I think, was created by Leonardo da Vinci. He made, it was either Leonardo or Michelangelo who made a four-horse chariot in bronze that was then melted down by a later conqueror, potentially Napoleon, and turned into cannon because turning art into weapons of war is, is what we have to do sometimes. Greek sculpting culminated during the classical period, which saw fundamental changes in both the style and function of sculpting as an art form. So, for those people who are in my class, uh, we are going to get into the classical period in just a week. So 480 is the time of the Persian invasion, the second Persian invasion. We covered Marathon. This will be the second, uh, the second one. Spoilers. Uh, you, you should have known that. Um, and then it goes all the way until the death of Alexander in 323 BC. The main characteristics of classical statuary were increased accuracy of anatomy and realistic stances. Poses became more naturalistic as sculptures began, began depicting real people. The tensile strength and lighter weight of hollow cast bronze statuary played an important role in these developments as the material allowed for many different open poses without needing the struts and bridges required in marble sculpting. Right, so if you have a, a pure uh, marble sculpture, it will more easily crack, deform, uh, and fall apart. So you see these struts, right? This is to, to support it. Uh, whereas if it were uh, if it were hollow, it would be more easy. It would be easier for it to uh, stand on its own. And it's not until the uh, Renaissance that we see the resurgence of really good, lifelike quality painting and uh, and carvings. And this is often attributed to the uh, the sneaking behind the church's back of people to uh, dissect cadavers. Michelangelo did this, a number of other Renaissance artists did this, uh, to get a better sense of how the how muscles functioned, how they pulled against each other, what they looked like under the skin. And I wonder if the Greeks did this as well. You know, they wouldn't have had this church's, um, the church's ban on desecrating the dead, or at least not in the, not in the same way. Ooh, that guy just hit his finger. Thanks. Good little detail there. Um, and so I wonder if these Greek artists were, uh, you know, going to some graveyards or battlefields, probably, uh, to dissect and look at, at cadavers. I see you have completed your tour. I trust you have a new appreciation for Greek sculptures. After learning of the heart and soul that was poured into each step of their creation. Now, what else would we're you like to do? We're taking a quiz. Y'all ready? Then let us dive right in. Here is your All first right, so question. So I moved the screen, Which so hopefully you guys can answer this Which era of sculpting one. came first? Hellenistic period, Orientalizing period, Classical period, or Geometric period? Okay, bonus points. Uh, I'll, g I'll give some extra credit. Who can put all of these periods in order? And this is when I find out that everyone watching has tuned out for this section on art, sadly. All right. Anyone? Going once, going twice? The... I've already forgotten the question. I believe it was, what was the first period? And I'm going to run with it. So the geometric period went first, then classical. No, geometric, then or orientalizing, um, then classical, then Hellenistic. So I believe the question was the oldest. Correct. Geometric. The geometric period lasted from 900 to 700 BCE and mostly featured small scale statues and statuettes of heroes and horses. A, uh, quiz On wrong. to the second question. Bronze was an alloy composed of which two metals? Can I trust you guys to answer this one? Or I know that my students know this. Copper and tin, copper and zinc, copper and gold, silver and gold. And bonus points, who can tell me in the chat? Uh, What's the not listed way? Well done, tin and copper. And what is the other way that you can make yes. bronze? To get the bronze required for sculpting, metal workers first needed to smelt copper and tin. One last Hint. question for you. It's deadly. And Which renowned sculptor it. was a native of Argos? Poly... Oh, my bad. Well... Yes, Polyclitos was based in Argos and had an enormous impact on the art of sculpting. You've done well, Traveler. Your knowledge of metalwork is astounding. 
All right, I think that's all for now. Then do I farewell, do I traveler. Get some cool loot May this? we meet again soon. All right, so that's one of three tours. Thank you guys for bearing with me with that uh, tour of bronze working. I do love this economics aspect, right? Uh, for me, this uh, this discovery tour is all about discovering the more pedestrian aspects of ancient Greek life. We talk about the high level, the politics, the great men. That's the, the great men style of history. That's what comes down to us. That's what's recorded. Uh, but I really like this uh, more day-to-day -day life. Okay, what do we have left? Is there anything in the city? Yes. I really enjoy this uh, yeah, daily life stuff. And it gives, us, it gives us a sense of stuff that we can apply to our own life a little better, right? How often are you going to be leading a bunch of hoplites into battle? Nah, maybe not. But in terms of de uh, sculpting or creating necessary materials, that's more likely. Something that's more visceral. All right, let's, let's change into this blacksmith. We're going to call him Hephaestus, which is completely not original. Look at this guy. Bronze, burly. Um, you can often, uh, blacksmiths would often have a lar much larger right forearm than left, right? The, the, if they're right-handed, the left is going to hold, and the right forearm is just going to bang on, uh, on metal. value. The ancient Greeks and Romans had a long history of making bronze statuary. Images of gods and heroes, victorious athletes, statesmen, and philosophers were prevalent throughout antiquity, appearing everywhere from temples and sanctuaries to public spaces. However, bronze statues had a high material value, and it is estimated that even a small-scale bronze statue would have cost around 150 to 200 drachmae in the 4th century BC. As a result, only the prosperous could afford to de dedicate bronze statues to sanctuaries, while poorer pilgrim pilgrims could only offer clay vases and statuettes. It would be really cool if they use drachmae in this way. They tell us the value of different things with drachmae uh, frequently enough that by the end of the discovery tour, we have a good sense of what a drachma is worth. Alright, so we've got this tour of bronze. Um, here is, is that the Hydra once again? And then this might also be, I think this is another uh, labor of Hercules. He was supposed to capture the Cernaean Hind, uh, which is, which was some mythical uh, deer. So within Argos, do we have any other points of interest? I imagine we have to go up here. So... Yeah, uh, we'll go to the Acropolis, regardless of whether or not uh, uh, there's a point of interest. Who does this guy think he is? Look at this weird dress. Oh, man, people are, people are riding their horses in town. Is this legal? These, is this a street legal horse? Yeah, let's go. Okay, we're going to follow this guy. Uh, pave the way. I, so he's got that cap. Um, he honestly looks a little like a Scythian archer. Now, I don't imagine they allow the Scythian archers to have horses in town, uh, but the Scythian archers are, as you may know, the police force in Athens. They were a troop of slaves. They were imported from the, uh, the Far East, and with their, with their bows, they operated as a police force. I don't know why they would use bows. That seems like a very odd uh, way to police a small city-state. It feels like clubs would be a good way to beat people up rather than shooting them. Uh, especially if they get close to you, what are you going to do? The Argolis Banner. Four part of a wolf, obverse type of a trio ball. The region of Argolis was a major center of civilization beginning in the Mycenaean period. In the Archaic and Classical period, the entire region was under the control of the city-state of Argos. The banner depicts a wolf's head, the main coinage of Argos. The wolf Leucos in ancient Greek refers to Apollos Lycaeus, who had an important sanctuary in his name. In Argos, wolves were offered as sacrifices to Apollo. That's metal. Okay, um, I love that. Wow, so typically I think of sacrifices as being farm animals, right? The things that uh, you might raise and have access to, but 
the Argives were badass enough, they had to go out, capture wolves, and then give them to Apollo. So, uh, Ubisoft, if you hear my plea, please let me steal things from these NPCs. Um, this guy's just like, he's just wearing this stuff on, on the street. I want that. I want that badly. Uh, here we have, this is going to be a shrine to Apollo. This looks like, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, we've got bees. There's a god who, for whom bees are sacred, and I don't think it's Apollo. Uh, I might be, I could definitely be wrong about that. Um, and we have two snakes. As far as I know, the main connection between Apollo and the snakes is that he killed Python, the giant snake that uh, swallowed the Omphalos at Delphi. And so he is typically represented as having killed, uh, or he's represented with like a snake head on him. And when we go to Delphi uh, later in the semester, we're going to be able to see the uh, we're going to see the bones of Python, which is very cool. Here we have a Greek theater. Let's see. I wonder if we can tell what, uh, what play is going on. It doesn't look to be well intended. It wouldn't take much to fill this whole crowd, uh, or this whole theater with people, but it looks like this is a very unpopular play, and it's just these guys' best friends supporting them. Oh, well, at least we have a best friend. That's very cute. So in Greek theater, wow, they are really going at it. Uh, they wouldn't be they wouldn't be hamming it up. Hello, body frame. Um, they wouldn't be hamming it up in. Well, at least not entirely like that. They would have masks on. I'm not sure exactly why they thought it was better to use masks. It might be because a mask would be more visible from, say, you know, that far away. Uh, it might be hard to tell a, per a person's facial expression from the back of one of their theaters, whereas a mask is going to be vivid, brightly painted with they, these horrific faces that you can immediately tell what emotion is on display. The Acropolis of Argos. The oldest sanctuaries in the city were built on the two Acropolises and housed the temple of Athenopolios, Zeus, Larisaios, Hera, Acrea, and Apollo Pythaios, which was connected to the Bloody Oracle. Ooh, I hope we learned about the Bloody Oracle. Okay, that doesn't seem fair though, right? That, and, uh, and it might be the reason that Argos gets screwed over so frequently in history is that most cities they've got like one or two big main gods athens of course is athena and they've got you know you got your your little minor gods. argos is like quadruple dipping they're trying to get all the divine favor and i think because of that the gods who are jealous right if they are anything they are <laughs> they are flawed uh they are probably going to uh they're probably gonna be like yeah screw these guys who do they think they are worshipping four of us? Um, so here's another uh, blue-coated blue-coated soldier. I can't tell what's on his ah. chest, but as you can see, uh, I just passed one of them. So Argos is part of the Delian League. And why is that? It's because they hate Sparta. And so they joined the Athenian uh, alliance. Okay, I'll, sh I'll show you guys that later. There's a bronze owl flag. Uh, demarcating Argos as an Athenian ally. Here we have the spoils of war. Um, that's awkward. So that's an Athenian shield, of course. Um, but yeah, after a battle, after a victory, they gather up a bunch of the, the loot of the fallen, uh, and they take it back home. They put it in probably something a little nicer than these piles, but it, it was kind of like a look at how dope we are. Okay, according to a brief Google search, Pan is the god of beekeeping. Thank you. Bees are also associated with Demeter in terms of farming and fruitful harvest. Melona was the patron nymph of honeybees. Thank you. Melona. So mel is uh, the root for honey. A mellifluous means flows like honey, and those with mellifluous voices have sweet and uh, wonderful uh, voices that flow like honey. Here we have a cool casket that if I was sacrilegious or uh, a renowned assassin I would I would take okay this guy is a little too ugly let's change who we are playing as so if you see anyone that you want uh, please let me know 
We're going to go Athenian Soldier this time, just to blend in. And let's check it. we got a Racing Horse. Phobos White. Let's do Phobos White. Um, so Phobos, I imagine, is the name of the horse. Oh, look at this guy. Um, Phobos is also the name of one of Ares' uh, best friends. I don't know if they're his children. Um, but also what's really cool is Mars, uh, the planet, is the same, of course, the same name as the Roman god uh, equivalent of Ares. And of the moons, uh, Phobos and Deimos, who are the two children or followers of Ares. Phobos is fear. And so when Ares would go into battle, he'd be followed by Phobos and Deimos, Phobos causing fear in the, uh, the people in, on the battlefield. Sorry. Move out of my way. So, uh, there are a few important things to note about Argos. Uh, the first is... Let's see. Okay, we don't need to be back here. Oh, here's my horse. So Argos, uh, as was mentioned, uh, was constantly, or frequently at war with Sparta. This starts in the 6th century, and Sparta in uh, Sparta and Argos fight. They, uh, they declare war on each other, and instead of having a pitched battle, they decide to have what's known as the Battle of the Champions. And so rather than sending out their full contingents of fighters to this battlefield, they set, send 300 picked warriors. And 300 is going to come up a lot I'm sure just saying 300 conjures up some images or ideas of Greek warfare. S but uh, in Sparta especially, 300 was the number of the Hippies. And so the top three graduates of each year's agoge would be, uh, would be chosen as captains of the Hippies, and then they would themselves pick... Uh, uh, 99 other people to follow them, making a grand total of 300, which would make up the uh, the king's bodyguard uh, and the elite soldiers for that year. They're going to be the youngest, most uh, exuberant soldiers. And so during this battle, the champions, each side sent 300 dudes. Um, they fight for a whole day. It was brutal. And by the end, as we're told, so we're told, uh, there were three Argives left and one Spartan. And for whatever reason, the Argives were like, cool, we won. Let's go home and celebrate. And the Spartan stayed on the field. Now that's a little fishy, right? If you outnumber the guy three to one, I guess maybe you're hyper wounded. Um, but otherwise, like, if you've killed 299 guys, what's one more? Just kill him. But they didn't. And so they went home and Sparta was like, well, that's not how we play this game. And we were on the field at the end of the day. We were the last one standing. We won the battle. And so then there's this tiff. Nothing was resolved by the Battle of the Champions because then they both send out their, their armies. Uh, Sparta defeats the Argives and takes over quite a bit of territory. And so if we look at the map, it's going to be they took over this valley uh, up until the border of Argos. Let's see. We have this guy left. And then don't think we'll get down here today. I think we'll carry on to Athens, um, maybe hit up Salamis. Nope, we're not going to hit up Salamis. We're going to hit up this area. Uh, we'll fast travel to Zeus after Argos, and then we'll explore the city of Athens. But first, we'll finish Argos and then save the Argolid for later, because that's going to be a major place in the Peloponnesian War where uh, the a Athenians, because of their, their naval reach, are able to raid the shores of the Peloponnesus. So that's 700 meters, so let's, let's get our ancient SUV. Yeah, move, buddy. Let's see if Bobos can catch us here. With a bloody or Oh my god. Whoa. So, once again, uh, if anyone wants to do a little bit of, of uh, research, anyone wants to do this for an artifact for class, like, please. Oh my god, I've never heard of the bloody oracle. This is... Ugh, are we going to wade in the blood? God, that's crazy. What is going on here? Are they not going to tell me anything about this? Please. So 
like... I mean, every oracle is somewhat bloody. Anytime you want to talk to the gods, you gotta spill some blood, but this is another level. Oh, that, that looks to be a pot of black broth. We do... We love Spartan delicacies. Yeet. I just... That was a very silly thing. Uh, that just went on in my head. I, I'm thinking in Latin. I was like, how do I make yeet a reflexive verb? To yeet oneself. That's basically what I'm looking for. Okay, let's call for those. Your shop here. There's a, uh, I don't know if anyone knows David Chang, but he's a, a food blogger, uh, slash, he, he worked for Vice and, or at least Beast Gear, um, and he goes to all sorts of crazy places, shows you some really cool, uh, food, uh, food from around the world, and, okay, so here we've got some bronze trinkets, as I said, this is probably all very expensive stuff, um, but David Chang, he goes to Mongolia, and I'm like, hell yes, I want to see Mongolian delicacies. He goes to a meat market, and there's just, like, horse meat especially, but all sorts of meat just sitting out, flies everywhere, black with the swarms of flies. That just reminds me of what we just saw, which was really gross. I am, at this point, a vegetarian. I'll eat meat on occasion, so, you know, flexitarian, I guess, but... I gotta say, there are a number of times I'm really happy to just lean into that dietary choice and say, I'm good on the meat tonight. I don't need to eat that. Uh, and that that would probably be the case in the ancient world. Definitely the case in Mongolia, although I don't know if I'd have a choice in Mongolia. I'd probably, if I wanted to eat, have to eat some horse flesh. Which my roommate tells me is delicious. Uh, just gonna put it out there. He lives in Kyrgyzstan. He, he's eating horse. Uh, he was totally... He said it was quite good. The architecture of each city, town, and village reflects both its location's biome and the building materials readily available. For example, example Argos, capital of Argolis, and known as the White City, is constructed from marble. Shown is a variety of concept art by Hugo Putzwoli, Miguel Bouchard, and Caroline Susi, depicting the types of buildings and structures the hero will encounter in the game. The variety of heights, sizes, and spacing is important to keep the locations navigable during gameplay. Like most Greek cities, there is a clear distinction between rich and poor, with muddy streets and low ramshackle houses, leading into stone structure, clean roadways, and plenty of vegetation. This is a really good reminder that I should slow down a little bit. I do wish there was a walk version of this, um, where I could just chill out and actually walk the streets like all the civilians I'm constantly bumping into, uh, or running over, I should say. Um, this brings up, uh, I saw recently an Atlantic interview with the designers of SimCity, um, and they were talking about the changes that they had to make, because what they want to do is a, a, a city creation simulation, so that people can just hop right in and build a city. And they're looking at Google Maps, and they're trying to recreate Google Maps in SimCity, and what they realize is there's parking everywhere and if you have to use the same parking minimums that modern america uses or many places use uh, it's a really boring game it's a little bit a bit of a dystopian hellscape so they had to put all the parking underground uh, so as not to make their cities look as nasty as our modern cities black and white lines sketches by miguel bouchard of multiple temples and residential villas show the raised steps and intricate walkways between buildings as well as the ruins of an older temple so Argos, the old city. This actually looks like the uh, ruined temple of Minos found on Crete, I believe, by. Oh, Herman? No, I'm totally blanking on his name. Heinrich Schliemann, I think, was the one who uncovered Troy. I know he did. Uh, he uncovered Troy, but I don't know about Argos, or I'm sorry, Knossos on Crete. Um, I think that was Arthur, I think. So, uh. On a rock hill in the Argive Plains, Mighty Walled Tyrans. Oh, will you tell me what that was? Mighty Walled Tyrans? Anything? No? Okay. Let's check out Fort Tyrans. 
Very cool. It looks ruined. Um, what I, one other thing that I, I love, I'm going to say that a lot, what I love, is uh, how frequently you see ancient ruins in ancient Greece. They had a very tight connection to the their past. People had been living in their area for a thousand years. And so Fort Tiryns, as we can see here, is occupied by the Athenians. We have the Blue Owl. Um, but it looks like this um, it looks like this fort was probably built by the uh, by the ancient Mycenaeans at the very least, or the, the Minoans. Um, some are guys in the second millennium BCE. So, oh, here's a wolf. You better watch out, wolf. We might sacrifice you to the gods. All right, I think that's all I want out of Argos at this point. We may return to the Argolid, uh, Asclepios, and Epidaurus. Okay, cool. So event, when we get here, this is going to be all about ancient medicine. But for now, we're going to fast travel to the Altar of Zeus, travel around Attica, and we're going to end here, which is the Battle of Marathon. And my hope is to get to Marathon on Thursday. And God's willing, we will be all caught up with where the class is uh, by the end of Thursday. And once that happens, I'm going to go down to streaming twice a week, because this is a lot for all of us. All right, let's synchronize. Check out Attica, ladies and gentlemen. So Attica is going to be the largest uh, or Attica is the region with um, Athens in it. Athens is going to be the largest city-state in Greece, um, both by population and land size. So Attica early on was unified into a single city-state, which that doesn't mean everyone lived in the city. Um, let's go up here first. There is, of course, a huge amount of hinterland. There are areas, um, there are a lot of farmers, but the main urban center is going to be is going to be Athens, and so for voting for any urban functions, municipal functions, they're going to come to one city, and that's Athens. And the mythical founder of Athens is Theseus, and it's likely that Theseus is first not real, and second, an amalgamation of uh, whatever founding myths united the Attic. Uh, villages into a single polis, right? That's going to be the main function of an archaic founder is no, don't, you don't live in your tiny little, uh, you know, your little hut villages. You're going to live in a polis with a single uh, set of municipal functions, uh, a single set of uh, cultural rights, of uh, civic identities, etc. Das Gubermensch. I haven't heard that name in a while. How effective were sieges during ancient Greece? Did an ancient siege rely on starving out your opponent, or sh were siege assaults effective? Great question. Um, so uh, many of you may, uh, many of my students may have heard me talk about this, but they didn't have great siege weapons. I actually learned on the stream that they did have battering rams. Thank God, right? That's a very simple concept. All it takes is a ram butting you in the nuts once, and you're like, okay, I got the concept. Um, they had battering rams. They had ladders. That's about it. So oftentimes sieges, uh, the enemy would build a wall around the uh, the polis wall, and uh, then they would starve them out. Yeah, but the the supplies of ancient Greece are very difficult uh, to you know to transport. Right. So if we check out this map, uh, this is incredibly rocky mountainscapes. So if you are besieging anywhere further than a couple days journey, it's going to be really hard to resupply yourself. It's another reason that Athens was impregnable during the Peloponnesian War, because they had a port and they had the biggest navy in the world. So, or I'm sorry, that the most powerful navy in the ancient Greek world. And so they uh, were able to constantly resupply themselves and no one was able to besiege them. Also, just a quick point on that. Uh, we turned back and what we saw uh, was a burned farm. And this is set during the Peloponnesian War. And so what the, the Spartans did is they would invade Attica and burn all the farms outside of the city walls. But that, as I was just saying, that wasn't good enough. The 
the spark or the Athenians could constantly resupply themselves, and so it wasn't uh, it wasn't as devastating as the Spartans hoped. It was certainly demoralizing, and the Athenians, uh, especially the young men, would sit on these walls watching the Spartans burn their crops, enraged and begging to fight uh, and to go out. And it was a huge political conundrum. Oh, hello, lion! Wow, they have lions increase. That is hardcore. Um, but they they couldn't do anything, and so it was really a clash of wills. Uh, would the Spartans continue to invade Attica and uh, for seemingly no result? How long could they last versus uh, how long could the Athenians last before they went out and fought and very likely lost a, a battle? Um, so yeah, to answer long long answer to that question uh sieges were sometimes effective and it was mostly about who could who is better able to equip themselves and supply themselves during that time it was almost as hard if not harder to su keep yourself supplied um, as a besieging force as it was at, to be besieged cities are typically going frequently going to have wells within their limits um and uh they would probably have enough warning to bring in a lot of uh, their food, depending on the time of the harvest. So let's check out what points of interest we can find in Athens. Here, it looks like we're in a relatively middle class area going off the, uh, going off what they were saying last time. Got a rug merchant. Hello, hello friends. I want this golden laurel leaf crown. Looks super cool. Got some Tyrian, a Tyrian purple robe. This guy's very rich. Everyone we're seeing is rich. Let's look at it. Like, everyone's wearing gold or... So Tyrian purple comes from the city of Tyre, uh, which is off the coast of modern-day Israel, I believe. Um, Tyre, they had uh, they had seashells. I think they were scallops. Um, I'm sorry to do this off the dome. I'm, I'm probably spitting uh, false news. Uh, but yeah, so they had uh, these seashells, they would crush and they'd turn into purple dye. And this was the most uh, precious, rarest dye and why the uh, most august people in ancient Rome tinged their togas with purple and why you'll see here the very richest people like that dude just walking around in the dirt uh, would wear purple because it's the most expensive uh, way to beautify yourself. Oh, cool. Okay, so we're getting an introduction to the legal system of Athens. Here we have the trial of Socrates, which happens in 400 or 399 BC. Trials were presided over by official magistrates, and the jury was composed of citizens, or heliasks. Any citizen could make an accusation, and if the defendant was convicted, the accuser received a portion of the sentence fine. This practice led to the eventual appearance of pr professional accusers, known as sycophants. Cool. So that's where the word sycophant comes from. Um, so this was a change by, I believe it was Solon, who previously, before there was a robust legal and civic system in Athens, uh, the rich just ran the show. And the rich had uh, essentially private armies of uh, you know thugs, and they could do whatever they wanted. And Solon made it so that anyone could bring an accusation against anyone else. So one of the important aspects of this is that a poor person who's wronged or run over or harmed by a rich person isn't going to want to uh, sue them. They're too powerful. It'd be like me uh, suing Walmart. I've got a couple hundred bucks. I can pay for legal fees and they have billions. That's not working at all. Um, but if a person is wronged, uh, that uh, the, the wrongdoer might have enemies or anyone else, maybe just a sycophant, a pr professional accuser or a professional lawyer, kind of like the ambulance chasers we have today or the, you know, run over by a train, call 777-7777. Um, and they will take the case on themselves. And as you see, they're going to get a portion of the proceeds or, or the, uh, if they can, they can make their case successfully, they will profit on behalf of that. So that keeps everyone in line. It makes justice a public or a, should I say, democratic institution or a, a responsibility. 
The accuser and defendant were given equal time to speak, and their allotted time was measured by a water clock called a clepsydra. Their speeches were often prepared by professionals known as logographs. Logo means word or reason, graph means to write. After the speeches, jurors secretly cast their votes by putting a token in one of two urns. Interestingly, if the accusation was unfounded, the accuser would be convicted instead. I do like that. Oh my goodness. Um, if you br wrongful suit, now, look, there's a lot of times trials haven't gone the way that they are supposed to go, but that's, that's hardcore. That is, uh, that's pretty cool. If you don't prove your case, you're going to prison. Typically, you wouldn't go to prison. There was a, a prison in Athens, but I believe it was only used to hold criminals until their trial. Uh, the modern uh, innovation of holding people in prison for years of their life is very recent. It's incredibly costly. It, Athens couldn't afford or wouldn't want to do that. Uh, and they would rather just beat someone or like chop off their hand or something more humane. And truly, I, I do want you to think about this. Is it more humane to take years of someone's life away than it is to publicly flog them? It certainly feels better, right? I don't want to go to the public square and see someone getting beaten. Um, but on the other hand, 15 years of someone's life, that's... Time is really the only... One of the few things that you can't get back. I mean, truly, you can't get your hand back. Uh, so I don't want to lose a hand for stealing either, but... 15 years or years of your life for a crime is... Some might argue barbaric. The South Stoa. The, stout, thous, the South Stoa was, unsurprisingly, located on the south side of the Agora. Uh, the Agora is, as we know, the main central meeting place for ancient Greeks. And this is doing commerce, uh, so trade, they're going to meet with lawyers. People will give public and political speeches here. Uh, it's where much of the business that requires the meeting of multiple people, this is where it would happen. Uh, built during the first decade of the Peloponnesian War, so 431 to 421, the building was about 80 meters long and large enough to contain 16 rooms. Based on evidence of dining couches lining the walls, it is thought that some of these rooms were dining halls where magistrates were fed at the public expense. So people doing work for the city uh, were fed uh, by the public treasury. Uh, this, the only ones I know off the top of my head are the boule, and the boule is are the people it's the upper house the people who are drafting legislation or prov um, working together to come up with solutions uh, to the day's problems or drafting the initial legislation that will then be put to the assembly and those people uh, i think there were 50 of them at in any given month um, they would be fed at the public expense socrates when he was asked what uh, his punishment should be for uh, corrupting the youth he's like you guys should feed me at the South Stoa. You should feed me for the rest of my life because I'm doing such good work for you. And they're like, actually, we think you should die. And uh, between the two, he was killed. Based on evidence of dining couches lining the walls, uh, da, 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 the purpose of another room was inferred by the discovery of an inscription that suggested it was used by the metronomoi, the magistrates in charge of weights and measures. So here we have that word metronome, meter, measurement, uh, metronomoi. So why are weights and measures so important? Because trade back and forth, you're going to want to make sure that everyone is using the same uh, metric for the bu for bushels of grain. And this is going to be really important um, in terms of making sure that no one's cheating each other. Right? If someone's got a uh, an extra heavy weight, they're going to be able to charge more for things or, or get more for them. Uh, so the, the metronomoi are uh, essentially the anti-corruption offici officials of the ancient world. It's possible the other rooms had similar commercial functions as excava excavations of the building have turned up numerous coins. So if we look at the Agora, you have these public public areas They might be kind of like a WeWork situation um, where you know anyone could show up for the day and kind of hold an office space. This would be where lawyers might entertain or meet with clients. Um, it might also be that people would uh, rent them out and they would be specifically offices for different people. This, this could be um, the uh, place for official uh, officials of the state. I love these people. Look, you've got a whole bunch of rugs just like right there. Why don't you lie on them instead of the tiles? That would be so much more uh, comfortable. Yikes. 
Okay, so... Can anyone tell what's going on? This, I don't recognize any of these scenes off the dome. Uh, that looks like a bad night in college. This woman is swinging a spear at this guy. Yikes. Um, got beautiful robes and togas. Just, yeah. Man, do I need to... S should I censor this game? They, there is an option uh, to get rid of historical community, but I think that everyone, everyone here can handle this. Do I need to make... Do I need to say, though, that this is a uh, mature stream? Because we've seen a lot of dicks. Okay. Um, it looks like we're entering the Agora. And here we have four painted statues. And remember, statues are not to be white like we see them today, but instead would have been painted. Beautiful. Look at these guys. The Eponymous Heroes. View of the eponymous heroes in 2014. I bet they don't look as good. Yep, uh, it looks like the eponymous heroes. <laughs> wow, this is like the saddest thing I've ever seen. Um, so there are no eponymous heroes. They are gone. <laughs> That's disappointing. So when when you talk about ruins, you really you get a ruined image. The monument of the eponymous heroes was built in honor of the heroes from whom the ten founding tribes of Athens took their names. So eponymous means giving their name to. Um, so, you know, oftentimes you'll have eponymous albums. So the band uh, Led Zeppelin, let's take, has four eponymous albums, Led Zeppelin 1, 2, 3, and 4, because they are so original when it comes to naming. Uh, not really, but their songs are quite original. Um, they're great, but eponymous means lending their name to it. So you have an eponymous archon, which means that uh, whatever magistrate was the eponymous archon, instead of, uh, he would kind of give his name to the year. So they would measure their years both in ha wh what Olympiad it was, but also uh, who was the Archon at the time. And the Romans do the same thing for the consuls. The eponymous consuls are going to, uh, at the beginning of a historian, they might, uh, or of a chapter, they might say, it was the year of Livius Curtius Rufus and uh, Lucius Pugnacius Sulla or whatever. And so Athens is going to have the same thing. And eponymous heroes are the ones who lend their names to the ten founding tribes. Athens was divided into ten tribes when Cleisthenes reorganized the political system in 508. And this is when we see democracy. And I'm sure the next uh, stream that we have, we will get a tour of Cleisthenes' democracy. The tribe's ten heroes were chosen from amongst the mythical figures of, the, of Athens by the oracle at Delphi. The chosen figures were Erechtheus, Aegeus, Pandeon, Laos, Akamos, Aeneas, Kekrops II, Hippothoon, Hippothoon, Ajax, and Antiochus. Um, I recognize only a few of these names. Ajax might be the, the hero from the Trojan War. He might not be. Uh, Kekrops, uh, the first was a, a mythical king of ancient Athens. Kekrops II, I don't know. Athens' tribal structure meant that citizens voted by tribes, and the Council of the Boule featured a rotation of tribal delegations. Let's see if Cinder's going to say hi to us today tonight. Oh, she just woke up. Say hello, Cinder. Um, we'll see if she, if I can get her to be a lab cat, but I imagine that she's a little, she's a little antsy after sleeping for the past 19 hours. Yeah, she's, she's not about ancient Greece. She's much more of a, uh, an early modern and modern historian. So there were 10 eponymous, uh, heroes. Uh, these are only four, but we'll take what we can get. Got a little, uh, this reminds me of the, the little stalls that you have in the mall that uh, sell things, although these look way cooler than what we have in our local. Uh, okay, so, it looks like people are getting angry. Need a light. Okay, so this is a Bouletarian. Uh, Boule, as I've mentioned, is the upper house of the, of the legislative process. And so this is going to be uh, the kind of like the Senate of the ancient <laughs> As I shove a powerful guard who's hopefully not going to beat me up. The Boule. We have a bronze statue of the order. Bills passed by the Prytanes had to be submitted to the citizen assembly, the Ecclesia. The Boule and the Ecclesia worked together in coordinating and calling the assembly. Um, yeah, 
So the boule would put stuff forward to the ecclesia. The ecclesia and the assembly are synonyms, they're the same thing. When laws were voted on, they sent the relevant decrees to the city's mag magistrates and inhabitants. They were the link between the decisions made in the assembly and their implementation. Cool, so the ecclesia is gonna vote on things, and then that will be, this enables the boule, it goes back and forth. I've, I keep saying the boule introduces legislation to the uh, ecclesia, but also the ecclesia can propose things to the boule. So anyone who's been in my class where I've tried to uh, ask for student input and democratic, uh, democratic running of our own classroom um, knows that you guys have all these great ideas. It's really hard to implement them. And so we take, the boule takes the ecclesia's muddled, crazy, zany, cool ideas and synthesizes them into a cohesive platform that the magistrates can then uh, take take over. Um, and so this, yeah, this is a really good point of, you know, the Ecclesia cannot be counted on for constructing the complex legislative processes that a, an empire is going to need. Same thing with, uh, I think, a lot of our legislative problems today is everyone's like, damn it, why don't they do this? Um, why aren't the laws like that? And then you get laws that are like 2,000 pages long. No regular person could come close to coming up with the complexity of these laws. And so you need representatives and specialists to translate the popular will and desires into uh, effective, uh, effective legislation. Now, that the, the denser and more complex legislation gets, oftentimes the more corrupt it can become, right? All it takes is one line and one page in a 1200 page bill that gives someone 10 million dollars but uh for the most part a complex society or a complex civil complex civilization requires complex legislation the boule also supervised other matters like city finances magistrate coordination sacred affairs etc cool so here's the bulletarian uh, it looks like we're getting within 10 minutes of our stop time so let's see how much more we can see tonight. Oh, damn. Oh, who is this? Anyone? Anyone? Ten points to uh, whoever can tell me who this is. This, this should be. Look at that. Who else do you know who teabags a uh, man bull person? Ah, oh, damn it. Gave it away. Yes, this is Theseus, the mythical founder of Athens. As I said, he's probably the name ascribed to the consolidation or unification of all Attica under, yeah, very good Hestia, uh, under one um, or under one city. Theseus is a hero linked with the mythological or origins of Athens. He was responsible for the political unification of Attica and as such was considered a symbol of Athenian democracy, um, or at least Athenian identity. I don't know how, how much the democracy and the goes back to Theseus, but I'll give it to him. Uh, the myth of Theseus goes back to the 7th century BCE, but it wasn't until the 5th century BCE that he started to be incorporated into Athens' civic ideology as the founder of the city. Theseus was the son of Aegeus, king of Athens, and Aithra, daughter of Pythias. Aithra was also possessed by Poseidon, which means Theseus had a divine father in addition to a mortal one. Okay, uh, I don't know how that biologically worked. Possessed is, you know, of course, a uh, arcane uh, word to make light of a situation that could have been pretty awful. Um, Aithra gave birth to Theseus on the island of Spyros. After growing up, Theseus traveled to Spyros to, from Spyros to Athens, accomplishing several labors along the way. Um, so it was kind of like Athens wanted their own Hercules, and so they, uh, they gave Theseus a bunch of labors himself. The most notable was, the, was Procrustes. Uh, the bed of Procrustes is... Uh, Procrustes would grab you, or I, I think actually he, he was just like, oh, you're, you look tired, take a nap, and he'd give you a bed, and this bed was probably very uncomfortable unless you were like the 1% of the population that perfectly fit it. it was, if it was too short, he chopped your leg off, legs off to make sure you fit, and then you'd probably bleed out, and if you were too long, he'd strap you to the rack. Um, it sounds like just some awful 1970s serial killer, uh, and Theseus was like, oh no, no, 
not going to happen. He killed them. Uh, the bandits Perifetus, Carachion, and Procrustes, killing the Chromionian sow, a wild pig that was ravaging the region of Chromion. Kind of like those crazy pig boars that exist in Texas. Have you seen these things? They're like nine feet long, a thousand pounds. Uh, they're horrible hybrids, have like nine kids a year. And we need a Theseus with, to show up with a shotgun. Uh, I think that this is one of those things where like uh, Texans are getting into helicopters and shooting pigs, uh, which is as cool as Theseus is. I think that's that's pretty cooler. Uh, so the other uh, bandits, I think there's one who's like, yo, you should look over the cliff. And then when you were looking over, he'd just like kick you over and be like, haha, uh, which doesn't sound nearly as bad as Procrustes, although you probably did die on impact. However, Theseus is best known for his capture of the bull of Marathon and his killing of the ferocious Minotaur. So, um, release depicting Theseus slaying a centaur. I wonder how they know it's Theseus. Uh, he has a club just like Heracles. So, like I said, uh, Athens was like, we want our own Hercules. <laughs> and they got him. They made their own up. Uh, which is, and it's interesting that, uh, it didn't, it wasn't until the 5th century that they started to incorporate him into the unifying myth. So this was probably, um, you know, the 5th century is classical Athens at its height. Uh, the Age of Pericles is after they help win uh, two wars against the Persians. And so this was Athens has a new sense of itself, is creating a new identity, and it is in charge of a large empire. Uh, so it's creating a, a whole new set of mythology uh, around its origins to make itself feel even cooler. Um, Athens is known as autochthonous in the era of the Dark Ages. Uh, there's a lot of migration and population movement going on, and Athens was very proud that they had never themselves been invaded. Almost every other place in Greece had experienced some sort of invasion, and uh, Athens was autochthonous, or grown from the soil uh, after Hephaestus, uh, oh god, what can I say on here? After Hephaestus um, got really excited by seeing Athena naked, he uh, splooged all over her, and she's like, this is disgusting, legitimately so, takes a rag, wipes it up, tosses it down on the earth, it falls on Attica, and the soil and the splooge <laughs> grows up, and that's the Athenians, and the Athenians are very proud of this fact, so we'll give it to them, and then they have Theseus. So, someone please distract me. The Garden of Hephaestus, wow, well, that's awkward, I was just talking about him. In the precinct of the Hephaestion, excavators have discovered archaeological traces of the Garden of Hephaestus. According to their findings, trees and shrubs used to be planted in rows running parallel to the main structure. Cool. Uh, so this, I guess, is return of Hephaestus to Olympus. Um, so here we have Hephaestus not crippled, um, which is quite cool. Uh, typically, Hephaestus is uh, portrayed as crippled, and here uh, he's not. I guess they, the Athenians, given that they are descended from him, uh, are going to say, oh no, he's like totally sound of body. And, oh, look at, look at that little uh, invisible... Ooh, look, Ma, I'm floating. Love that. Uh, I am kind of magical. Um, the Festion, here we have the top light. And we have this nice, uh, beautiful gardens of this. Looks like it's getting dark. And let's go to the Temple of Hephaestus, and we might, we might call it a night at that point. Um, so this looks like it might be the Panathenia. If you if you know about the Elgin marbles, the Elgin marbles are uh, a frieze that went around the Parthenon um, and were bought by a Lord Elgin, a uh, British guy, who took them, paid the Turks who owned Greece at the time, and then brought them back to the British Museum. This is a point of contention. Uh, and, oops, sorry. Um, and Greece is pretty pissed off about this. This is part of their cultural heritage. Makes sense. Um, and the the Elgin marbles depict, uh, at least in part, the Pan Athenea, which is the Pan All Athenea, all of Athens um, festival that was in introduced under the uh, under the 
dictator, sorry, tyrant Pisistratus. Uh, he created a number of uh, festivals and uh, civic institutions that built up Athens and, and made them more uh, impressive, richer, and, uh, and well regarded. So the Panathenaic Games were a series of games, a festival that was put on for, uh, that eventually attracted all of the Greek world uh, in addition to just being a pan Athenea game. So we, here we have, again, awkward. So that story I told you about Hephaestus and Athena being a little too incestuous, or at least Hephaestus being that. Um, here we have a temple to Hephaestus. So here's Hephaestus. Um, we've got a big old treasure trove. And here, I wonder if this is made in Argos, which is bronze. Here's Hephaestus. Um, and then elsewhere, here we have Athena, it looks like. So I'm just going off. Uh, I might be wrong here, but this looks like the classic depiction of Athena with the, the helmet tilted back, ready for battle, ready to kick some butt. All right. Um, so that is an hour and a half exactly. Uh, is there anywhere that you would like to see before I tune out? I will say we're not going on to the Acropolis until... Uh, until the middle of the fifth century once our once our class gets to the reign of pericles who built uh the acropolis and and the parthenon sorry he did not build the acropolis but he did build the parthenon and that's when we're going to go up there and, and check it out in more detail because that is that's going to be a big moment um i will check out the rest of the agora though i do want to i should aim for a little bit of completion here uh, and then, as, I, as I've mentioned, tomorrow and Thursday are going to be a lot of the rest of Athens, culminating in the Battle of Marathon. And I think um, on Thursday, if we do get to Marathon, we'll do the tour here. Uh, but then I have another video game called to Rome Total War, and there's a, uh, a, an ancient version. So I think I'm actually going to play the Battle of Marathon. We'll, we'll have a whole army of, like, you know, a, a few thousand men against several thousand Persians who are landing on boats, and we'll see if I can kill them. I tried over the weekend, and I actually, uh, I, I lost. So hopefully I can channel uh, Ancient Athens uh, and not die at the Battle of Marathon. So this is the Agora. Here's the Fountain House. As some of my students know, um, Pisistratus created an aqueduct that brought wa extra more water in to keep the, the city's population healthier, um, less disease-ridden. And the Fountain House is probably going to be where um, the where the uh, uh, aqueduct ends. Water was supplied to the agora through fountain houses. Aqueducts delivered the water to a reservoir, and the overflow was evacuated through a drain. Fountain houses are amongst the earliest public buildings in the agora. Excuse me, Cinder is telling me that she needs to needs to leave my room. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, one final little cameo, and then you can run away. Um, so, black figure Hydria with a scene of women at the fountain house. So here we have the spigot. Uh, I shouldn't say spigot, but this is the um, this is where the aqueduct channels out, and you can fill your vase here. So in the ancient Roman world, uh, they did not have um, what are they called? I I guess spigot, spigots or um, I am totally drained. Uh, blanking on a very common English word, which is how you turn on a, <laughs> a sink. Uh, but they couldn't, sh taps, they couldn't turn off the, the water. So the water was constantly flowing. And this is one of the ways they kept their cities clean is the water would flow through the aqueducts and any water that would, did not end up in one of these uh, hydrias would end up washing uh, all the grossness in the street out and into the, um, into the, uh, the early sewer system that they had. Hestia says, Athens was generally such a sexist society. Do we know how they ended up worshiping a really cool warrior goddess and how that impacted the culture? God, great question. It was incredibly sexist, and I hope that one of the tours in Athens just talks about the life of women. Um, it's, I will, so it's important to always remember that the sources we have are just as, if not more sexist than the society itself. Women are going to have a, they're still going to have a, a rich life where they can interact with one another, they, but they could not go out in public. Their life was uh, probably pretty similar to that of a, uh, a woman in an 
a modern is um, let's say like Saudi Arabia you know they are going to if they go out in public and those when that happens they're typically going to have to be completely covered and for the most part women were not supposed to be outside if they were uh, they were considered prostitutes and were kind of ripe for the taking uh, which is a really horrific uh, way to uh, you know uh, run a society. Now that's probably an over overstatement. Um, I can't imagine that any woman uh, wandering the streets was uh, going to be treated like that, but the expectation was that women would not show their face in public. Now, uh, how did they worship Athena? Cognitive dissonance. I don't know, but it's a great question, and uh, I think you should write that down for one of our students to, to answer uh, in a paper. I think that would be a really great uh, uh, paper topic. Points. Te the Tetradrachm of Athens. And this is, unlike the coins we've seen before, in Sparta we saw all these coins from much later. This is from the classical era. Athenian coinage was the most ab abundant Greek coinage in the 5th century BCE. Uh, the coins came in many denominations, from tiny coins uh, to larger tetradrachms, which are going to be the biggest ones. At one point, Athens even struck an issue of decadrachms, so 10 instead of 4, uh, weighing 43.2 grams. These large coins dated back to the 460s and have been linked to either the Athenian victory over the Persians at the Eurymedon River, so after the second Persian invasion, the Athenians go over to Asia Minor and bring the fight to the Persians. Uh, which resulted in an enormous amount of seized booty, or the capture of Thassos and its rich mines. Athens also occasionally struck gold coins, and from the end of the 5th century BC, they minted bronze coinage as well. So the Athenians, um, under Pisistratus, uh, began printing their own coinage, and they had a very strong reputation for high quality, high silver content, and not uh, screwing around with that. Uh, you might think... I was thinking the other night, because this is the dorky thing that I think of when I try to go to sleep, is uh, how did inflation happen in the ancient world when you know, you're not having a huge amount of change in economic productivity? And a big reason that you might see inflation is that the rulers of a city would uh, devalue their coins. So they'd take a bunch of the coins together, they'd melt them down, and then add a cheaper uh, material. So if you have silver coins, you might add bronze or zinc or some other metal that's going to mix in with it. And thus you take a thousand coins and you get 1,200 coins out of it. Thus the value of the money decreases, creating inflation. Um, and Athens didn't have that problem. They, they became essentially what you know, the US dollar, the reserve currency, or the, I should say the, the currency that everyone was willing to use in the Mediterranean. Uh, and this is also because of the mines of Lourdes, uh, which we will see uh, later on here, the Lorian silver mines are going to be a later edition. All right. Um, I think that's going to be it. I've had a lot of fun tonight. Uh, let's, so let's end on uh, with some energy left. I don't want to exhaust myself. Uh, but and I don't want to exhaust you guys. This is as long as a class, and we haven't even had a break. And thank you. I'm amazed that no one has been asking for a break in class or in the, in the chat. This is very different from a normal class. All right, guys. Um, I will see you tomorrow, 6 p.m. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I've had a great pleasure with you. And uh, thanks again for the questions and the additions.